Hi everyone, my name is uh, Boris and I work in the theory team as a quantum information scientist. And uh, now I'm going to tell you about how to generate randomness in a certified way. So it's this project that we have in Candela that you might have heard about under the names uh, QRNG or Entropy or Device Independent Randomness Generation. And I will now explain uh, what, this, uh, what this means. But before that, let me tell you about uh, what's a quantum information advantage. So in the theory team in Candela and in many theory teams in the world that are working on the quantum information, one of the things that we do is we look for tasks for which using quantum information allows us to do better than if we were using classical information. And uh, for an application to be available now, it must have three features. First, it must have a provable advantage over classical information. Uh, it must be implementable with the technology that's available today. And it must be provably useful. So these uh, three features might uh, seem a bit trivial to you, but let me give you some examples of quantum information processing tasks and explain a bit why they are not so trivial. So for instance, you might have heard that with a quantum computer, we can factorize big number in a very efficient way. And so this is, this is true. Like we have an, uh, an algorithm for factorizing big number that, is, that has an advantage over all known classical uh, algorithms. So it checks the first point to some extent. And it's also very useful to factorize big numbers because uh, it allows you, for instance, to break many encryption systems. But it's not implementable with today's technology because it requires a lot of qubits, uh, some numbers that we are far from uh, being able to reach nowadays. Then you might have heard also about boson sampling, that is another quantum information processing task um, that, has, that has an advantage over uh, class classical uh, versions, uh, modulo some computational assumptions that, uh, that are very likely to hold. And uh, we can implement it with the technology that's uh, available today. Actually, it it's one of the tasks that's, uh, with which we uh, demonstrated um, the first cases of quantum computational advantage. But it's not clear if it's useful, right? because in the definition of a quantum information advantage, we didn't say it has to be useful. Uh, it just needs to give us an advantage over classical information processing. So it is the case for boson sampling. Boson sampling is probably also useful for some things, but it's not completely clear at the moment. And then you might have heard also about variational quantum algorithms. So these algorithms are uh, nice because they can be implemented on the technology that we have today. That's actually one of the reasons why they were designed to be implementable on these so-called NISC devices. But it's not so clear what kind of advantage they provide and how useful they are. So in some specific case, we had uh, demonstrations of clear advantage, but for very, very specific cases. And in general, we don't know so well. But then there is one application that checks all the three boxes, and that is certified randomness generation. So the, the goal here is to be able to generate random numbers. And while we generate these random numbers, from the numbers alone, be able to certify that they are random, be able to certify that they could not have been predicted by anyone. The, this problem that I just formulated, it's impossible to achieve it with classical information, but we can show that with quantum information, we can manage to do that. So it has a provable advantage. We can also implement it with today's technology. And actually, in, in Candela, we already implemented it uh, in a photonic way. And it is uh, probably useful because random numbers are a valuable resource for many applications, such as uh, cryptography, for instance, or for numerical simulations. So this way of generating and certifying randomness is one example of uh, an application that checks these three boxes. And it's certify the generation of randomness independently of the device that we used. So that's why we call it sometimes certified uh, device independent randomness generation. So now let me tell you a bit more about how this works. And to explain this, 
I will explain to you what is a non-local game. So in a non-local game, we have two players. Uh, we usually call them Alice and Bob. And they receive some questions and they need to give some answers. And the game goes like this. They cannot communicate during the game. They can agree on a strategy beforehand, but once the game has started, they cannot communicate. When in the simplest example that is called the CHSH game, they have two questions each and they can answer, they can give one answer or the other. So two questions, two answers each. And the rule of the game is that for three pairs of questions, their answers must be the same. And for the last pair, their answers must be different. With classical information, you can win this game only three out of four times. One example is, for instance, if Alice and Bob always give the same answers, then they will be right 75% of the time and wrong for the last, the remaining pair of questions. And actually, you can so show that this is the best they can do. But now, if you give them an entangled pair of photons, for instance, or any entangled systems, system, they can do better by performing some good measurements on their, on their share of the states. And by reading the result of these measurements, they can achieve up to 85% of, uh, of win for this game. So this is an example of a quantum advantage because we have a task for which, with quantum information, they win more than with classical information. And the thing is, this is useful for uh, randomness certification because you can show that if they win more than the classical case, their answers cannot be deterministic. They cannot be known in advance by anyone, even independently of the device that they use, even if they don't really know how the devices that they use behave, and even actually if quantum theory is not valid. So this is a very, very strong result that is related to one of the most important discoveries of the, of the 20th century. And I don't have time to give you details about how this, how this works, but this is a very fundamental result in quantum information theory. And now we have a way of uh, using a non-local game to generate randomness in a certified way. So we can implement it on, on a photonic chip, for instance, which is what we, what we did here in Cornella. So here you have a photo of the photonic chip. We send some photons to the chip. Actually, so the photons are created by our single photon sources. The entanglement actually happens also on the chip. Then the questions that we ask correspond physically to some unitary transformations on the, the, the photons. And then the photons are sent to uh, detectors. And whether they are detected in one or the other of the detectors, both Alice and Bob have two detectors each, give them their answers. So the, the detector that clicked corresponds to the random bits. And then we can show this kind of bounds, that is the quantity of interest, that is the smooth mean entropy, this H epsilon mean, is bigger than n times, where n is the number of photon pairs that you send, some function of the advantage that they observed uh, when playing their game with some correction term. So I don't have time to give you details about how to derive uh, such a relation. This is uh, what we call a security proof. There is some complicated information theory behind it. But what's important is that now we have a certified bound on the number of random bits that we produce in our experiment. And that this bound is device independent. So it uh, holds even if our description of the device is not completely accurate. But there is one caveat here. As you can see on this photonic chip, we don't have this kind of wall of bricks that we should have to prevent communication between Alice and Bob. And this is because we cannot guarantee that there is no information flow between one part of, and of the chip and the other. And so this is one of the problems that we have in the implementation. And this is one of the questions that we address uh, in the theory team about this randomness, certified randomness generation project. So I will conclude with this, with the, the kind of questions that we, that we look into. So for instance, what kind of functions can we put in this uh, mean entropy bound? Uh, how can we prove that a given function is a valid bound? What are the best non-local games that we can use? So I explained to you this game that is called CHSH, but there are many others. How do we implement such a protocol with the, the technology that we have in Candela? 
And then how do we take into account discrepancies that we might uh, have between the theoretical requirements and the experimental implementation? So for instance, this fact that we should have a wall between Alice and Bob and that we actually don't have it. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, for instance, on how we can connect randomness and uh, winning a non-local game, or how we derive security proof, or, or how we take into account these uh, discrepancies that I just described, don't hesitate, don't hesitate to ask me. I'm always uh, happy to, to talk about my work. And thank you again.